This episode of UK Low Carb Podcast is sponsored by Deliciously Guilt Free. Enjoy the show. Um, and just we before go. we kick off, that, what, what are you actually looking for out of this interview, um, what, Dan? What, well, what's the sort of, um... I've got a few angles to go for. At this point, I was trying to stall because what Tom Watson didn't realise that I actually had planned a little treat, a special surprise. I'd organised with Richard Morris from the Two Keto News podcast to pop into our conversation for Tom to have an opportunity to meet him because I know from downsizing what a big impact that podcast had on him. And so at this point, Richard Morris joins us. Is this Richard Morris I see before me? G'day. Richard, hello. Good. I'd like to introduce you to Tom Watson. Hi, Tom. Richard. You may not recognise me without my silly hat. <laughs> well, I can re- I can recognise your accent as well as your hat. But um, right. how lovely to see you, Richard. Well, it's a bit out of the blue, but we've been trying to organise this for a while now. I wanted yeah. to give you a chance to meet each other because I know that you uh, said in the book Downsizing what a big impact that had on you. And um, you talked about other podcasts. Obviously, this one wasn't around then, so that's why I guess you didn't mention mine. Anyway, and um, and then Richard and I were talking and I said, you know what? You were mentioned in um, in that book Downsizing. Do you want to I meet no Tom idea. at some point? So I thought it's only right to to facilitate an opportunity for you to chat to each other. So there you go. That's kind of you, Dan. And Richard, I mean, you did have a big influence on me because I, I guess I now know there's a lot of people who been on their own kind of low carb journey where you you because you, you have to sort of piece together your signpost your own nutritional journey. Uh, and I was really in the the foothills of understanding of what. What, what was possible uh, and, and and I I sort of stumbled into your podcast and what I liked about it was it, I mean, you did a lot of the science underpinning the sort of practical application thereof and uh, so I, was, I, I used to sort of get a few recipes or discussions nice. out of the two of you but it was the science that really interested me and your own journey what I mean, you, you you know, when you defy your own government's public health advice and you're a politician, it was it was quite a big deal for me. So you yes. you, you guys gave me a little bit of comfort in the early weeks um, oh. and inspiration, I would say. So I really appreciate that. I'm and, I'm on it, Tom. That you know, we uh, for for me, I was just a type two diabetic. I'd never been interested in biochemistry. Um, I was a computer programmer. I was quite successful. I'd retired early in that. Uh, in my 40s back to Australia to live a quiet life and try to lose some weight. That's all I thought I was going to do. And then I was diagnosed diabetes and uh, I ran across somebody else inspired me. I mean, Tim Noakes really inspired me. And, you know, as I said to Tim when I was able to interview him, you know, um, I've been lucky enough to be able to go on and and inspire Carl and then the pair of us would inspire others to, to do their own podcasts and write books and and talk about their own journeys and uh you know you're just you are part of this pay it forward generation of type 2 diabetics and and people who are you know uh, are, are trying to make sense when the world's sense making machinery for diet advice is broken so um, yeah. thank you for joining us well, how, how did you meet Carlo, Richard? Because you, you you used to record your podcast over two continents, didn't you? Which I, I know yeah. we don't know, but back in the day, that was that was quite a technical feat for both of you, wasn't yeah. it? Yeah, it, it was. It was on the on the bleeding edge. What we did was each of us recorded locally to a local uh, to a local device, and yeah. then we had an editor switch them together and remove the 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 tra- uh, trans Pacific pauses. Um, and you never know it. You never, never heard it. But we were literally having. We were in in opposite uh, ends of the world doing that. And the hard so, thing of that is as well is the time zones, right? Because we're we're doing the episode at the end of October, and we've got four time zones: Mountain, Eastern, uh, British summer, and now Australian summertime, which right. clock changing makes everything harder. And, and and ours changed just Sunday. Just yeah, just yeah, last yeah. Sunday gone, Some states so. change in November. Britain changes late October. So trying to do that. So you must have done a lot of late nights. I mean, what time is it there now, Richard? It's uh, about eight eight thirty six in the PM. Oh, so it's not too uh, yeah, bad. So it's like midnight or whatever. Yeah, perfect time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, Eight thirty-six for me. That's that's getting to my bedtime these days. Because <laughs> as soon as you go, as soon as you get your health back, you you realise the relationship between sleep and insulin management. It's and, so important. Yeah, yeah. You I, need your I know. It's, 
as a programmer, uh, I was very successful in my career because I I was able to survive on five and a half hours of sleep every night, and my competitors had to have eight hours, so I had two and a half hours of extra coding on top of them. So yeah. that that was my that was the only secret to my success. But you know, I ended up getting type two diabetes. So you know, that, that you do that long enough. And do you think the sleep deprivation uh, contributed to that, Richard? Because I I sometimes wonder whether you know when I got I. I pretty quickly started managing my sleep you know i i as matthew walker says i i aimed for eight hours a night um yeah. and i think that really i think that had a big impact on my sort of insulin resistance quite early on i think there's a bunch of factors there's what we eat obviously uh there's how we treat our bodies and sleep is involved in that and also not exercising is also a factor and then yeah. the third factor is genetics my my grandfather, I didn't know this until fairly recently, but my grand, my paternal grandfather was type 2 diabetic. Um, he ended up dying of a heart attack in his 70s, which was unusually early um, of his generation. And uh, and I didn't know that he was type 2 diabetic. My father's a doctor. He was a doctor. And, um, and it was just not mentioned in our family. It was just, you know, um, he had a bit of trouble going to the toilet and then, Next thing he had a heart attack, and and it was only then, you know, uh, I I learned recently when I when I became diabetic, my father said, oh yeah, that runs in the family, and I, yeah. it was a surprise to me. Yeah, I, I had a, I had similar experiences actually. Uh, yeah. and, uh, I wish I'd known all these things twenty years before I actually found it all out, but you know, I'm glad I found out eventually. We yeah, know and now. Like say pay it forward as well. Pay it forward. So that's the other thing, isn't it? I think once you do know and you realise how you work, which is what I've learned, you suddenly think, hang on a minute, I bet there's a lot of people in the same situation as me who need this help. Um, how you do it, I think that's the next question. You'd have to do it in a compassionate, open way, and they've got to be ready for that advice. You can't just go around saying, do you know that you're insulin resistant? You know, that's not really appropriate. I know Richard's had that experience with a, 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 a lecturer recently. But I just think you're right. You know, you've got to... You just want to tell the world about it, which is a very natural response when you feel healthier and you get your health back. Yeah, I, 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 I you know, when I was in public life, I, actually, it was a, it was someone from the low carb community in the UK. What explained to me that perhaps the best thing I could do was publicly admit I had type two because there's still a lot of shame with the condition and. Yeah. Um, you, you know, if you, unless you're just honest with yourself about the condition you've got, you, you're never really going to address it. So, I, and I, but I didn't want to say that I'd got it and then put it in reverse before I was really confident that I was there. So I kind of set myself a, a year to keep my uh, the, the weird sort of measurement. I, I just used the HbA1c um, reading that that my GP ran me through and when when that was consistently in the right range for a year i thought okay i can admit this now and then i just started talking about my story and the amazing thing in parliament was the number of mps that would i could tell when they they'd sidle up to me in a sort of division lobby or in a corner of the house and say oh you know i read about that thing in the paper i'm really worried what what should i do yeah and then a little bit further down the line i had a lot of MPs knock on my door from all political parties and they would say, my wife has told me I've got to come and speak to you. <laughs> <laughs> and it was really, you know, I mean, and, and I, I didn't, I felt, I wasn't quite ready for that because I, I didn't feel like I could give hard advice. I'm not a clinician. I, I, did, I wasn't, you know, I wasn't trained in any of this. So I was really, it was really important to me that I said, look, I can only tell you what I've done, but you've got to do this yourself. You know, I can only tell you what worked for me. And I, so I, I, in the end, I ended up doing a lot of signposting. So I, I actually sent a lot of people to your uh, to your podcast in the early months. Wow. There's probably other MPs that were listening to yeah. what yeah. you saw. Wow. That's quite an honour. Well, I should give them a shout out next time we record it. Uh, an episode because we're back to recording again. But sure uh, I had this. I had the same problem. I can't. I can't go up to a stranger and say, um, you know, I, can I help? Because the, it never works for me. Um, the best I can do is to put out the podcasts, understand as much as I can about it, and that's really why I went back to school to do biochemistry. I, I got a, a biochemistry degree with honors last year. So, um, or the past four years, I've been working on it. So. Um, to, to try and have at least some 
uh, reputational platform to, with which to be able to talk about these things. Uh, so that so I know a little bit more about how the mechanism works, but you know yeah. that, that the, the problem is that our sense making uh, machinery, uh, you know, the dietetic organisation to who who we hold up on a pedestal as our experts, and they, and with respect, they've put a lot of effort into understanding this stuff. They get the type two diabetes entirely wrong, and um, and so the advice that they're giving is 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 really is unhelpful for type two diabetics, unfortunately. Yeah, I agree with that. And actually, I I in the UK, I, I mean, I don't want to knock them because they're doing their best, but I I met mm -hmm. Di Diabetes UK, the charity. Uh, and, you know, I kind of said, look, I'd love to be in a position where I, I could have a very hard policy commitment if ever we make it to government. That's another story, by the way. But, um, mm -hmm. you know, but how we can sort of, uh, uh, you know, start getting proper reversal programs in place and get the numbers down. Um, and they were sort of a little bit challenged by it. And, and then a couple of months later, I noticed they'd, they'd got a very lucrative many hundreds of thousands of pounds sponsorship deal with the parent company that licensed uh, Pepsi in this country. I thought, wow. well, that's terrible. Well, you've got to be joking. I mean, that, that's like Jack Daniels sponsoring Alcoholics yeah. Anonymous. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah. So I just thought, I mean, you, you know, there's not, there's not really a lot of advocacy for people with a condition in the system yet. But, but, that, but your, your podcast is... You know, it's begun to change that. I mean, there were there were. I mean, there's a there was a conservative opponent of mine called David Davis, who he read all the science and the, the challenging science, and he decided that Public Health England, which we've just abolished in the UK, they were given mm. the wrong dietary advice on carbs. So, and he worked for Tate and Lyle, didn't he? I think he, he did. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. I I I said to him, well, you know, you've got a lot of redemption in many areas of your life to. To do here, David. I mean, we disagreed on lots of things, uh, but I, I said if you start with the sucrose uh, industrial complex, that's not a bad contribution to public life. And he and he really has. He's still, you know, yeah. he, he's, he's banging the drum for low carb. And I, now, now that I know you're on, there's one thing you can advise me on now that you've got now sure. that you've actually taken a deep dive. Uh, mm -hmm. The one thing I miss most in uh, in the carb world is obviously bread, right? Um, I need to know, and I'm probably going to just practice this with a CGM or test it on myself because I think that's the only way you do it. But is sourdough bread with proper fermented, decent stone ground flours, can you get away with that if you're type two? I, I, I don't see any evidence at all out there? Uh, some can. And it, it so so here's the thing with sourdough sourdough um, ferments over a longer period of time. A normal fast raising yeast, um, you put it in the bread, and now later you put the bread in the you, know, you rise it and put the bread in the oven, and 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 that's it. It's done. And the sugars that are in the yeast in the 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 in the in the starch in the in the the, the wheat is still there when you eat it, but a sourdough actually ferments the the bread ferments over. Uh, 24 hours sometimes so you know these these sourdoughs last longer and so the the yeast gets a crack at all of the starches in the in the bread so it can have a little bit less um, available glucose um, and you know within the range of you know if you're trying to keep to 20 grams a day if you if you you could have a slice of of sourdough bread uh, you know one slice in a day as long as you don't have a lot of other carbohydrates during the rest of that day um, yeah. The problem for me is always just having just one. <laughs> oh, <that's laughs> I love sourdough bread. <laughs> yeah, okay. I, I've, got, I've actually got a sourdough. I'm, 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 this is my week obsession. I'm, 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 or this week's obsession. I'm, I'm reading a lot around it. I've got a sourdough starter going. Yes. Uh, that yes. I just thought, okay, just the only way to do this is to test, test it out before, but I'll give it a go. But, uh, do you find, I... though, that eating bread once is one thing, but I find that, for me anyway, it triggers the the sort of compulsion to have it more. You know, like, I've never had that with steak. I can eat a ribeye and not have a ribeye for a week and be fine, even though it's more delicious than bread. But bread I eat, and then the next day I'm like, it's bread time, come on. <laughs> I am like that, Dan, yeah, I am like that. And that's what worries I, 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 I mean, the, once, you, once you've got off sugar and then yeah. you then you do keto and your weight comes off and you're 
you, you know, there's a sort of you're, you're then in a position where I think you can control your sort of your mental game with food, really, or you're much more aware of your yeah. your weaknesses. And I kind of I, I I still haven't worked that out yet. I'm still on I'm even though I'm sort of three and a half years in. Um, you, you know, I think I had food compulsions that, I, that are still there. I mean, if you a packet of kettle crisps in in yeah. any room. If you give me one crisp, I, I literally, I, I have to lose my back. I can't. I just can't stop. And that that is. I know there's a physical response there. There's a dopamine response in my head. I kind of know the science behind it, but I still can't rationalise it or overcome it. The marketers love that for that reason, don't they? They keep selling it. You keep eating it. We keep making it. You keep eating it. Yeah, it's a vicious cycle. Hello and welcome to another episode of UK Low Carb. I'm your host, Dan Grief, and this is a podcast made to help grow the grassroots movement for change that is the low carb and keto lifestyle, not just here in the UK, but also around the world. And like I always say on these podcasts, it's actually about real change and change happens from the grassroots up. People did not decide in Parliament to give votes to women in the, in the 18th, uh, 19th sorry, century. They didn't decide to give uh, the black rights movement their civil liberties. Instead, it had to come from people like you and I who would fight for change. And that's what this podcast is all about. And in particular, today's show is a very special one because not only am I joined by Tom Watson, which itself would be an amazing show, but also, as you heard from the beginning then, Richard Morris also came onto the show so that he could share his wisdom and his expertise. I really appreciate both of them coming on. Thank you so much to Tom and thank you to you, Richard, as well. And I'm also really pleased that I could bring people together, which I think is probably the best way that we can try to make a change is by people talking and communicating and also getting to know each other. So this episode, I will keep this introduction short, I promise. This episode is a very special one. We go through a bit of Tom's life. We talk a bit about his parliamentary career, whether being a parliamentarian is a healthy thing to do in terms of the lifestyle. But we'll also go into a bit about his change in life and not only the transformation, because I think in a way that's the superhuman story that most people can tell, but the maintenance part afterwards, which is the human story of how do we maintain a lifestyle that's actually healthy and gives us all the benefits to health and life that we need? So I'm going to hand over now to Tom Watson. I wish you all a very happy uh, weekend, whatever you're up to. And if you enjoy this conversation, please, would you just share it with somebody who might want to hear this? Could you leave a review on the podcast apps? It just helps us get the message out there. And if you need a good example of how low carbon keto could really make a bit, big difference to someone's life, then I think you need to study the life of Tom Watson and also Richard Morris. So I'll hand over to the chaps now. Have a great weekend and I'll see you all very soon. I am so excited now to be joined by two very distinguished gentlemen. Uh, firstly, Richard Morris is here from the two keto dudes who's popping in g'day, to, g'day. Join this, to join in this podcast. And also a man I've wanted to meet personally, although I have met him during his deputy leadership campaign in Cambridge when he came here. Uh, with a friend of mine, Pete Roberts, but I just want to uh, introduce uh, Tom Watson properly. He is the man who took on the Murdoch Empire, somebody who's not afraid to have a good battle in Parliament, and called Michael Gove, if you know who he is, a miserable pipsqueak of a man, which when I used to be a teacher, that, that was a big talking point at the time. He's also the author of Downsizing, and of course I'm talking about Tom Watson. Welcome to UK Low Carb. Thanks, Dan, and hello, Richard. G'day, Tom. Nice to finally meet you. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Yeah. It's a, a genuine honour. A genuine honour. Even though I've met you in the waiting room before we did this yeah. podcast, so we've already got into it. Yeah, it's been it's been kind of hard to organise time zones and dates and things, but I'm glad it managed to happen. Carl said he'd love to be here, but I think it's five in the morning for him right now. Yeah, okay. And I just said that's a sheer lack of dedication. If that was me, I'd be. <laughs> you know, if you're hearing this, Carl Franklin, you should be ashamed of yourself. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> um, firstly, how how was lockdown for you, Tom? How how did you manage to get through the last eighteen months? I, I like most people, it was very up and down for me. Um, the first lockdown. I was in great shape. I was running 5K a day. I was doing YouTube videos with famous influencers with loads of kids dancing around the house with me. By the time we got to lockdown three, I'd eaten far too much cheese. I'd slowed up on the running. I had a home office that was 12 feet away from the fridge. And so for the first time in three and a half years, I've put some weight on. Um, I'm pleased to say that I'm now getting it off again. I'm walking and running and uh you know i'm not going crazy about getting them i'm not trying to get it off really quickly because i know what i have to do now and i feel like i'm in control and it's just 
steadily getting it all back on track. So quite mixed, I'd say, Dan. But I mean, there must be millions of people in that boat, I think. Yeah, I think actually as well for me, not going to the gym suddenly, being at home, you can do the same workouts, but actually the same about being in a different environment, that's it just motivates me sometimes, whereas stuck at home near a fridge and board is not conducive to health, is it really? It really... Um, no. What about yourself, Richard? Is it the same for you? Did you find lockdown a tough one? Yeah, I found it mentally a lot tougher than I was expecting. I, I thought yeah, having to stay at home and uh, sit on the couch would be mentally easy to do um but we uh we we don't realize how important social interaction is even if mm. we don't if we're not particularly social creatures um humans need that and and uh so you know i i went through bouts of uh not not quite depression but just feeling will this thing ever ever end um you know the the we've been lucky rather lucky in australia i mean we're locked we're locked down currently but that's going to release on on monday um, but you know we have pretty much been unaffected by COVID for you know for a good chunk of the of the of the pandemic. So um, that's uh, uh, that's probably you know I, I I feel bad about mentioning how awful it is here in Australia because we've really done much better. So um, but yeah, I it, it was surprising to me the the, the mental effect of uh, of lockdown, but uh, the physical effect. I still get out and cycle every now and then. So uh, I wasn't. I, I normally do about fourteen k a day, and since during lockdown, I'm probably doing fourteen k a week. So yeah, there, okay. there was a drop wow. off. That's quite yeah. a difference, isn't it? Yeah. So Tom, I've read your book Downsizing a few times, but I've also because of your parliamentary career, I've known much more about your, you know, as a parliamentarian. But to read about your childhood, I thought was really fascinating, and I was going to ask you about that because. And I've got a narrative, or I'm trying to piece together a picture of you, if that's okay. Because yeah. it seems to be, I just want to piece together as a child how you were to how you are now. Do you think that when you were a child growing up, and we can talk about the environment you were in, that you were kind of a calm, relaxed kind of kid, and then you're going back to your personality now? Uh, because it seems like you say in the book quite often that through the addiction to food and, and the problems with sugar, you were a very different kind of personality. And I'd love to know... Are you coming back to who you really are? Do you know what, Dad? That's such a deep and difficult question to answer. Um, I mean, when I reflect on my childhood, uh, you know, pre-teens, I, I mean, I wasn't a quiet child, but I was, pre, you know, I wasn't sort of particularly wild. Um, and I'd read a lot of books, um, and then sort of got, I got into my teens, which is probably when my sugar intake went up um, and, you know, went a little bit mad, I guess, you know. But, I mean, that might just be because most teens do go a little bit bonkers, don't they? Uh, I, I say that as the parent of two teens, um, although they're very well behaved. Um, so, yeah, I, I think I, – I th and then I, I when I went into a career – you know, I went into a pressure environment very early on in life uh, and – that was not conducive to a, a fairly balanced, you know, um, sleep rich, uh, nutritious diet uh, balance uh, at all. And so now I do, yeah, I, I mean, I don't know whether I'm more childlike now, but I'm definitely calmer than I've been in 30 or 40 years now, M much more reflective and thoughtful, I think. It's interesting you say that because, I mean, I've been to Parliament a number of times and, you know, you, you, there have a number of bars there. So I don't know if you've ever been there, Richard, but when you go into no. this palace, it's, it's an incredible building, really amazing. If you come over, I recommend seeing it. But there are a number of bars. I think it, I'm right in saying that the alcohol is subsidised as well. Is that right, Tom? They say it is, but it always seems pretty expensive to me. So, so who's I, making I, the profit I, out of it, eh? I, I, I think the... I think the restaurants maybe but uh, i mean that's mainly for the staff but uh, yeah i mean it's it, it's a, uh, when i was first elected i think there were 13 bars in the uh, on the parliament site uh, they've knocked a few wow. of them out you know, but uh, i mean there was I, I would say there was quite a drink culture at the turn of the century when i was first elected but nothing like in the 70s and 80s i mean we used to have by elections every few months in uh, in the uk that's mainly because mps were drinking themselves to death i think uh, wow it, it's wow. better now um, but I, but I was elected quite young, and you, you know there was always. I mean, you know, you'd always go to a bar after work, so you know, bar and work blended, uh, and that's still the case for 
And the hours are crazy as well, aren't they? Because, you know, I I was there once and suddenly I was with my friend of mine, Mike Kane, and he suddenly had to go off for a vote. And you're thinking, hang on a minute, it's like 10 o'clock at night, you're still working. And some of those late night sessions are incredible, aren't they? It's not not conducive to health or good family life, I'd have thought. No, and also what what is a sort not really well understood by people who don't work there. The, the parliamentary time, it, it, it's not very well planned ahead. You, you kind of know when parliament is going to sit, but you don't know what the issues you're debating until a week or two before. Uh, and so you can, you, you know, you, you can have a sort of day full of meetings and then realise you've actually got to be in the chamber for an emergency debate or you're, the, you, you know, so it's very chaotic. Um, and so people sort of have fairly random, lives which again is conducive to eating really poor food very quickly on the run and, and you know drop it in a bar when you if you get a spare couple of hours um, so it's it's not a healthy environment really. yeah it's incredible in that way incredible mm. so good delicious really Yum. Really good. Mm. So tasty. Mm. I just want to ask you though, and this is something that did come up in the book quite often. And in in Australia, Richard, do you think that the journalists are quite tough on the politicians? Because I think Britain has got a very rough and ready approach when it comes to the well. I suppose it depends if you take on the tabloids yourself, then they're going to have a snap back at you, I guess. But I think in this country, certainly if you're on the left, a lot of papers are anti-left, a lot of, I guess, a lot of papers are anti-right. So is it the same in Australia? Do you think that politicians get it quite a a lot of abuse and get it in the neck? Well, I I think, with respect, I think you you guys might have uh, got it from from, from one of our expats, (laughs) Rupert Murdoch. Uh, I mean, that, that... when you say a lot of papers are, are anti-left, a lot of papers are owned by that that stable. And two of our former prime ministers are currently um, in a very overt uh, campaign against the Murdoch uh, Empire's um, uh, influence over 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 politics of uh, of everything from climate change to to vaccine uh, hesitancy to whether we go to war, who we buy submarines from, all of these kinds of things. So, you know, the the um, the, the uh, you know the, 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 there are some papers that do have an outsized influence and and can be very tough on on politicians. So, you know, um, uh, uh, that can be a good thing and it can also be a bad thing because uh, um, uh, you don't want you don't want a representative politician hewing to to the tune of uh, of, of a unrepresentative organisation. If 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 you can, so um, uh, yeah, so that that influence is outsized, and I apologise for that on behalf of all Australians. <laughs> I think you're taking a bit too much responsibility there, Richard. It's not your fault. <laughs> I, uh, Richard, my one visit to Australia, um, mm-hmm. I, I was only there for four days because there was a recall of Parliament, uh, and I had to fly back. But I was in Melbourne, um, and I was out talking about media plurality, and I did the Q and A show. In uh, in Melbourne, yeah, uh, very fun. But, but I was followed around by uh, a long lens photographer working for the Australian, uh, and it reminded me very much of the tabloid papers in uh, in, in London. And I, I did say to people, you know, do you normally get followed by these guys? And they said, no, no, you're you're our special guest. The <laughs> <laughs> time I was investigating phone hacking. And uh, you know there was yeah. industrial, industrial st- scale cr- criminality in the UK, which, which is still going on, by the way. But um, uh, but, I, but I, what I what I noticed about Australian politics is that the politicians are much harder with their language. Uh, in the UK, we, I mean, I got to, Dan alluded to this. I got told off for calling one of my conservative opponents a pipsqueak. Right. Um, which is sort of day-to-day language in the in, in Australian politics, is yes. that, would, that would be considered mild in Australia. I, I I recall a former prime minister referring to another former prime minister 
as a shiver looking for a spine to crawl up on the floor of Parliament. <laughs> so, yes. <laughs> was that Keating by any chance? Yeah, of course it was. <laughs> I didn't know that, but I guess it would be, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. There you go. If you get away with that in Britain, you'd be famous. I suppose Dennis Skinner's the closest we got, really, wasn't it? And then he'd get kicked out of the house for the day. Um, and But then... Yeah. He got way more press attention that way than if he withdrew the statement, I suppose. Yeah, um, yeah. But the difference I find in, in politics to probably anything else, and this is, I know you say you're thick skinned, but I'm just talking from my point of view. If I was being attacked for my personal appearance, the way I presented myself, and then they were making assumptions about my personality, you know, you're a bruiser or whatever because of your look, that must have hurt, right? I mean, you're still a human being and it must be pretty sensitive sometimes the attacks that are then personally against you not about what you say you could attack anything i say but when you attack me as a person that's a whole different lower league of of you know it's pretty low isn't it I, well i mean it it's a funny one this because I, and i do I get asked this quite a lot i mean there were times i mean that that guy from the guardian um i can't remember that cartoonist steve bell. bell steve bell yeah i mean he always portrayed me as some kind of like enormous you know, mountain of a fat bloke uh, and portray my leader, Jeremy Corbyn, as a sort of tiny Zen-like skinny guy. Um, and, and the, you know, the implication is there that I'm this criminal thug. I mean, he once did one with me looking ginormous, carrying a, a, a knife behind my back and all of that. Um, I mean, it's painful, but, I mean, it, it, the funny thing about UK politics is you kind of, fairly early on, you, you have to develop a sort of resilience to that. Otherwise, it'd push you under. So, uh, you, you know, if, if if you let it get to you, it could be really difficult. But I, I tried not to. Um, and then, of course, when I, but when I lost all the weight, um, it, 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 it very often do sort of before and after shots of newspapers. Uh, I think they thought that it would irritate me, but I loved it when they did before and after shots. It really, really <laughs> cheered me up. I thought, yeah, I've worked two years to get there. Thanks for that. <laughs> A bit of recognition at last, yeah. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. But then, of course, then the attacks were diminished figure. And I know that's probably tongue-in-cheek, but... Um, but it's interesting how you can never win with that sort of with the press, can you? But yeah. but then you talk about and I, this is what I found really interesting. Not only is your health for your own benefit and how you're going to live your life with your family and, you know, and the changes it makes. But also, I think you alluded to I'm sorry if I'm wrong here, that maybe that's seen as being you were thinking about your future career moves or is like a PR stunt or it was you know a threat to people. Is that really like the, the vibe you're getting from people? Is that how Parliament and politicians yeah. think? Actually, there were two things. When the weight started coming off, first of all, some people thought, has he got a terminal illness? Will there be a by-election? And, and I'm not joking about that. There were people mm -hmm. literally, you know, do, do, is, he gonna, is, is he ill? You know, do I need to move to West Bromwich? Uh, which was like... Low party membership goes up 700 yeah. in a week. <laughs> a bit of that. Bit of that. And, then, and then the second... But the, the other one was, you, you know, is he... Is he? Am I mounting a leadership bid? Am I doing? You, you know, so my the, the smartening up, as they saw it, um, was part of some kind of great big comms plan, rather than something slightly deeper and more existential, which which was a decision that I didn't want to die early and I wanted to live for my children. Um, because you say that, and then people think, oh yeah, good line that. You know, that's part of his comms plan. You know, so you, you can't read the the people that don't want to believe your motives they're never really going to believe your motives and so in the end you've just got to do it because it's for you and your family and, so and how surprised were they when your character also mellowed and suddenly you're not as stressed as they are maybe and you're much more zen like and able to take it in your own stride that must have been like this is a this is a heck of a plan he's playing here isn't it he's changed his whole personality how well, ambitious is he well uh, the person who was most surprised about that was me um <laughs> I, I, I sometimes um I mean, I've not fully answered this to myself. You know, did, did I chill out to the degree where, yeah, you know, I found the banality of day-to-day -day political life so odorous that I decided to take a leap and do something different? I'm sure that was part of my. I mean, there were obviously lots of political reasons why I left and um, and all of that, but um, it, I certainly, I, you know, I quite often would take a step back mentally and look at the situation I was in and think these people are tiny children and behave very badly. And I, you know, I don't want to engage with any of this anymore. I'd rather go for a run. Um, yeah. But I mean, you know, that's growing up, isn't it? And that's maturing. That's middle age reflection. There's a whole load of things going on there, but I think definitely the health journey contributed to that internal debate. 
you say that, and I think age is a really interesting thing. Um, so, you know, I, I've heard people say in their 60s, well, it's too late for me to change because I'm in my 60s now. And I think what a closed mindset that is. You know, you might have 20, 30, 40 years to go and you want to have good health, don't you? And, and even if you had 10 years to go, you want to have good health. But the fact, and I think this is one thing about your book I, I kind of liked the most, is that I felt like I was there with you. You're like when you're in the park and you start your exercise right. regimen, I really, I've been there. I've been there, you know, going to the gym after lockdown thinking, I don't belong here. What am I doing? I'm going to look an idiot. Realizing that really I'm a nobody, so nobody's going to know who I am or care. So why would I? But in your case, you know, you probably had the risk of people knowing you in, in parliament or the press being there. It's quite a risky thing to do. And yet you made that decision when you turned 50 that this is it. I don't want to die, which I thought was so powerful. But then you also had the bravery to make the change. And I think that should inspire, hopefully, a lot of people if you're listening and, you know, you're a certain age and you think, oh, I've always been like this. Well, no, it doesn't have to be that way. There's always hope. There's always a chance to change for the better. And when you do look at Tom's story, look at look at your story, Richard, look at so many people have just reversed their health problems to now being probably fitter than they were in their 30s, maybe even in their, in their 20s. And I think we should really take inspiration from that story. That's really kind of you to say, Dan, um, because I knew at the start, I mean, I, I didn't quite know how it would pan out, but I knew really I had to go through a lot of humiliation to get to the other side. I'd kind of prepared myself for it. But when I started doing it, I mean, you were alluding to a bit in the book where I went to Kennington Park, which was quite close to where I lived in South East London, beautiful park. Um, and Clayton, who used to train me, who I, who I genuinely think is contributed to saving my life I, I admire him greatly um he realized that my my kids liked boxing and so he started boxing with me on this hardcore basketball court in this middle of this park and this dad and his son used to take his dad used to take his boy to school every day and they were and they recognized me in the park and they'd always go, good punch, Tom. Is it Jeremy? Is it Jeremy? And I'd go, I, 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 you know, you're, you're halfway through a session. Yeah, Maxman. I couldn't lift my hands up, let alone speak to them. But they always made me laugh. And uh, it was very degraded and very humiliating. But after a while, it became part of the routine. Yeah, that's amazing. And I think I had two um, old ladies in the doctor's surgery just last week. And I took my son in. And uh, one said to the other, do you remember when 60 seemed old? And the other said, yeah, I do. She said, our children are in their 60s now. And I thought, isn't that a lovely sense of perspective and scale there? You know, today yeah. is the only day you actually have, everyone. So if you want to make a change, make it today. Uh, whatever happens tomorrow happens tomorrow. What happens in the past, let it go. But if you can make the change today and, and just take one step today, that is something. Tomorrow, deal with it when it starts. Um, but actually, you're, you've got a life to live. So live it to the full and enjoy it. Um, so, okay, so in terms of that, then, you did your research. So let's move to that part of the story. And, of course, this is where our good friend here, Mr. Morris, comes in. You looked into the podcasts that are out there. Do you think that if you were doing this change maybe 20 years ago, where, where would you have started? Because I think we're in a very privileged age where all this content is there now. We have the experts talking on YouTube podcasts. The Internet is is flooded with information. I sort of think 20 years ago, your, your parents' generation, what chance would they have had to have, to have learned like this? Well, you'd certainly have absorbed more of the marketing bump, which means you'd have probably taken the wrong path. Um, I mean, you know, 20 years ago, I, 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 I tried different diets. You know, I tried Weight Watchers. I, I tried the one where you have red days and green days. I the mean, cabbage I, soup diet, I remember you saying about that. I, I mean, you name any crank, crazy, fashionable diet with a big marketing budget behind it, and I tried it. And, and obviously, I failed on every one. That's partly down to, you know, the the environment I was in, but also these diets were rubbish, weren't they? They were marketing gimmicks. Um, so I, I would have, I, you know, I, the, I would have probably been setting myself up to fail again. Uh, and actually, when I came across Richard's podcast, I mean, I mean the lucky thing for me is there, there were, I, I, the actual point of the journey was some years before I committed. Um, when I happened to be reading Michael Mosley's books, but on a Kindle, um, and the great thing about Michael Mosley as a writer is a, he's a science writer, so he's got very good footnotes. And um, so I just followed the footnotes on the Kindle to the actual research. Uh, and, and my first look um, and reading was on the the sort of nascent research. It's much more developed now on ultra-low-calorie diets, the 800-calorie-a-day 
Dyer that Professor Roy Taylor up at Newcastle yeah. University had sort of commissioned it. You know, a, de- a decade ago, that was kind of breakthrough science, um, and the science isn't wrong. Um, but when I started to commit, I just thought, you know, I'm probably disciplined enough to do this for three months, but what, what do I do at the other end? Um, you know, how do I how do I live a normal life? I can't eat 800 calories a day only for the next 40 years. It's it's an unsustainable plan. This, um, but I did. But that's where I started, and that, and and so Michael Mosley opened up this world of what I would say is sort of contemporary research that challenged the orthodoxies that you know marketing had sort of almost made psychologically axiomatic. You know, these ideas that you know, low, low fat products were good for you that, you know, low calorie processed food you did in a microwave was, you know, sustainable, um, everything in moderation, you know, only drink half a can of Coke a day and you can run it out or those kind of daft mm. things that are just so ridiculous. Um, but they were kind of, you know, they're embedded in the psyche, aren't they? And, and, and reading the, reading the science and then talking to people who'd be, who were a little ahead of me on the journey, that's what was really important. So, so I read the, some of the papers. I found two keto dudes. I found a few other things as well. Um, and real, real people stories. I mean, this, your story, Richard. I mean, you got your health back, having un uh, this uh, are you uh, and and sort of having unpicked this jungle of misinformation. You, you you reach a point where you get so angry, and you were at the point where you thought, I, I you know, I've got a responsibility to give this to others now, and that, and you could feel the passion in the podcast, and that, and it made me feel angry, you know, because I'm relatively well read, thoughtful, policy led person, and there I was at 50 years old, and this stuff was sort of revelatory to me, uh, and I thought that th- there's a there's a massive public policy gap here, um, you know, there's no pluralism in the debate, there's no you know, and you know, led me into all. I mean, there's still things I look at now. Like, you know, if we'd have been in government, one of the things I wanted to get into a manifesto was that we would have an independent research grant for nutritional science, because yes. you know, all the nutritional science is sponsored by big conglomerates now, and you know, not all the research is rubbish, but a lot of it is, or a lot of it is kind of you know, proves proves the sort of marketing blurb. Um, and 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 that that was that's challenging in itself. You know, the, the sort of, you, you know the, the people are losing confidence in food production, um, and mm. you know there's huge social consequences when that happens, and policymakers have to address that. Yeah, you're totally right. But this is, I think, that's really interesting. You actually just touched on a point exactly what I was thinking there. So, um, do you sometimes think that you're the wrong place or the right place, the wrong time? Maybe you know. It being an opposition, so for those who maybe don't understand politics so much, and I, I guess it's the same in Australia, but you've got some parties who form governments, so in our, in our country yeah. it's normally one party. That government, of course, can really do what it wants because it has a majority in Parliament to get things passed through to be voted on. And if you're in the opposition, you can raise motions, you can, you know, opposition day debates and whatnot are not really very powerful at all, are they? Because you're not got the votes behind you. So do you sometimes feel the frustration that you learn, you know, can you imagine if when you're in Blair or Brown's cabinets and you could have had that conversation to say let's do it now whereas actually after 2010 you're not and that must be very frustrating on, on a million level i found that every day in opposition um I mean, you, yeah. you know I mean, the pointlessness of opposition the fut- the futility you, you know not doing everything you can to achieve that change through electoral success is was one of my biggest frustrations um and of course having been through the sort of phone hacking scandal and looking at the lobby power of the, the media, um, I then hit what is a bigger lobby organization, uh, a lobby, bigger lobby power in, in, in food pro in the food industry. Um, yeah. in fact, in researching the book, I was really honored to meet an octogenarian nutritional scientist called Marion Nessel from the East coast of America. Oh, yes. Yeah, I she, want to meet her. She sounds fascinating. She, she is. She has an ability. Um, and yeah. I mean, she, she's not necessarily sold on low carb, but she is. She's. She understands the sugar, the power of the sugar lobby um, to the point where she was followed by Coca Cola, uh, and she came to my office in Parliament. I, she kindly gave me some of her time, and she told me that 
Coca-Cola was spending $100 million to fight or dilute public policy around the world that reduced sucrose consumption. Um, and, um, and, and, you know, that really put it in perspective. To, that, that's an enormous, an enormous sum of money, but the, it's worth it for them. Um, and, and that's why, I, you know, it gave me a little bit. I mean, we, we actually, the UK was the first to introduce a sugar levy um, which other around the world people now sort of try and replicate or model or at least are discussing. And, and it, it's when I realised then that my, my conservative opponent, George Osborne, who was then Chancellor of the Exchequer, um, what a brave and lasting thing he'd done to get the sugar levy in. And that, yeah, that, totally agree. that led to reformulation of a lot of um, sugary drink products. Um, and you know, he's, that's probably going to be one of his great legacies, I think, because he, he, he could have really, yeah. epidemiologically, he's probably saved hundreds, if not thousands of lives with that levy. I agree. Have you read um, the, the Case Against Sugar by Gary Torbs? Because he mentions a quote by George Osborne in there, and it is really powerful because he said, um, of all the, th- I'm paraphrasing, so if, if he listens to this, which I doubt, I am sorry for butchering your line, but he said something along the lines of, you know, leaving Parliament, is there's one thing I could do for my children one day, it would be to know that I took out the sugar in their food to some level. And I thought, wow, that's powerful. That at the old, Ultimately, at the end of it, that's what politics should be, shouldn't it? Making the world better for your children. And And I think you're right. He has a huge, huge impact on that. Yeah, I mean, he should be very proud of himself for that. I mean, the tragedy for me, I mean, you know, the politi- politicians move on. Um, and we had this issue where, you know, our new Prime Minister, Boris Johnson, described sugar taxes as as um, sin taxes, which is obviously that kind of insidious yeah. lobby message. The, the lobby messages have got into him. But actually what, what gave me encouragement was since he had COVID and he had sort of quite a you know, complications with COVID. He's obviously looked at obesity as a public policy challenge. And I think the debate in government is now, um, you know, they're ready to realise that actually it's not just down to independent willpower, that there is a there is a role for government to, to intervene in food production, to, to try and give people a little bit more of a boost in, in those choices they make. Um, because the system is stacked against you, it, 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 unless you've got the time or the energy or the wherewithal to really radically change your life, you, you know, spend many hundreds of hours reading and doing stuff. The st- just walking down the supermarket aisles, it's almost impossible to do the right thing, isn't it? Um, yeah. yeah. And now, when it, now I think when you've been on low carb or you've been on keto, you've got off sugar all this kind of amazing benefits you get. You, you know, the, the, the thing that really struck me, I, I think you might have talked about this on your podcast, Richard, there's just there's, there's aisles and aisles of empty nutrient products now. There's whole, yeah. you know, half the supermarket, the stuff on the shelves. You, there's just whole whole aisles I don't bother going down because there's nothing yeah. red, nothing there to, there's, there's nutrition, has nutritional value. Yeah, yeah. They're, they're, they're almost, it's almost like, I mean, if I go down the bread aisle, it's like I'm looking at sponges. I don't even see it as food. <laughs> no, you, know, you know, there are breads that I, I like and I would eat again. Um, I would I would love to have somebody invent a, a keto croissant because I love croissants, but, you know, uh, but but failing that, I, I don't see any of that as, as, as food. And, and, and when you think about it, I mean, the cereal, the cereal business is a, is, a, is a very lucrative business because the actual cost of the paint on the boxes is a higher cost, a higher input cost to the manufacturer than the contents inside the cereal box. Is that right? So, yeah. yeah. So, you know, it, it's, it's scary, it, it's, isn't it? it? It's it's you know it's it's the cheapest possible cheapest possible components things that can be produced really industrially in in massive amounts seed oils and um, and grains um, uh, these are foods designed to be made from the cheapest possible ingredients and then they're sat there fortified to 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 meet whatever our lowest minimum bar of nutritional standard is. And you see the claims on them. And I was thinking back about this the other day, that prior to the 1960s, the claims on cereal boxes would would be something like all the nutrients a growing child needs. And then sort of in the 70s, it was everybody was talking about low fat 
um, and then they were talking about um, low cholesterol, and, and now it's all high high in protein. Or actually, we went through high fiber as well. That was another That's another right. health claim. And now it's now it's all high protein. So you walk down the cereal aisle today, you see high protein everywhere, but it's just the same the same product. Yeah. You know, yeah. with with you know maybe maybe as you know a fraction of a percent of a of a of an increase in one nutrient, but. It's, it's Richard, just have interest. When the pandemic hit and you had this lockdown more recently, so this kind of winter for you, mm-hmm. were, were those the aisles that were cleared out first? Because I noticed in the UK yeah. where I live, they were gone and, and the lamb shoulders and stuff were left mm-hmm. uh, for me. But I, I <laughs> guess um, I very kindly uh, obliged them and I took those. But but all the pastas, all the cereals, all the toilet rolls, yeah. Uh, all the other nutritionally empty things, they just vanished. <laughs> and, and you know, and it was the nutritious stuff was left behind. I thought that was quite sad. It was the same here, except there, there were some categories of meat that, that were scarce because uh, it's an entire supply chain thing. And so, yeah. um, you know, it, it, it's uh, a, a box of cereal can sit in a warehouse for, for, for a year before it's sold. And so the, the number of steps in the supply chain were a lot, a lot shorter. But, um, yeah, it, pretty much all the cereals, yeah, all the pastas and and what was left was uh yeah you know, fresh vegetables and 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 meats that are difficult to cook like uh pork belly or as yeah. you say leg of lamb you know uh all the mince was all of the the, the minced meat was all gone uh, ground meat was all gone so uh yeah <laughs> Yeah, the steaks were left, thank God. Um, That's so that fine by me. Adv- advantage Greer. <laughs> but, but let's be honest, and this is a serious <laughs> problem now because I, I know you've both experienced this and I, I certainly have as well. I, I do feel compassion for those people. It's not their fault. Yes. You know, like like no, Tom said, you know, it's the messaging, the marketing behind it. But the saddest reality is, and this is what I love about doing keto, is that you realize you're not part of the hunger cycle. And, and that was the biggest revelation for me. Now, I know from your book, Tom, that you've said about that and how, you know, you had to have your 11s as Kit Kat bar or whatever to try and keep you going. But there are millions of people who are in that cycle right now who are feeling pretty miserable. And you think a world who are working on kind of sugar high, sugar lows, feeling hang- hangry a lot of the day. How's that affecting their productivity, their psychological health, their long-term health? There's so many factors there that are affecting us as countries. And it makes me think that when you're not in that cycle, how much more productive and happy you are, what better place society could be. You know, it could be transformative in all our countries in a way that I don't think we've probably ever seen before. And I just I just hope that's where we're heading towards one day. Yeah, you, you know, Dan, I mean, you, you know, at one point I was looking for health economists to sort of help me sort of model some of, you know, what, what the impact of, you know, X percent reversal rates would be and type 2 and all of that kind of thing. Um, but, I mean, it is a productivity issue. I mean, type 2 diabetes is a productivity issue for the UK. I mean, if, if yeah. 10% of the NHS budget spent treating people with it, uh you know, calculate the number of hours they're off work with various conditions, you know, uh, you, you know, there, there, there's a taxpayer interest, there's a UK economy interest, these are things at scale. Um, before you, I, I mean, you, you know, you, you could get to, you measure the well-being of the nation. Um, I mean, it's very hard to describe to someone who's not been through, you know, keto uh, and sort of re-engineered their diet to the point where they've got rid of the brain fog um but it is like a release from prison isn't it it's it, it's, yeah, it's 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 freedom much. it's uh you, you know it's a different life uh, and you know i want people to have, feel as joyful as i do uh now um and you know so i think you're right you know if you do these things if you can get if you can re-engineer the british diet at scale you know, there'll be massive productivity gains. There'll be, you know, there'll be well-being gains for families in every town in the country. Yeah, it's incredible. Somebody actually said to me once, and I, I don't know if this is true, but I, I, I like the theory. They said if you look at like medieval society, uh, you know, in in Britain, in Europe, we were drinking alcohol because that's the only clean liquid we had. So we were drinking like you know fairly light ales, but they're still they're still alcohol. When suddenly things like tea and coffee entered into society, the enlightenment started. Was there a connection between wow. the foggy brain going and suddenly having stimulants and, and drinking cleaner cleaner fluids? And I just thought that could be true. I don't know. I like the theory, but this could be the enlightenment part two. You know, this could be the next massive step forward because we're now working as optimal human beings. 
that's such an interesting theory. I mean, it, and it's plausible, isn't it? I mean, I mean what yeah. the other interesting thing, I mean, obviously the relationship between um, nutrition and cognition is being understood with research being published every day. And also, you know, the, 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 the microbiome of the brain, uh, which is linked to what we put in ourselves. Um, and that's quite an exciting area, isn't it? I think the next 10 years, I mean, people will be looking about, you know, cogn- the sort of technological cognitive enhancement coming down the line. If you sort of read, you know, uh, some of the great Silicon Valley thinkers, uh, but, but we could actually go back to nutritionally enhancing our cognition as well, I think. And, that's what really interests. It's lose. It's the brain. Get rid of the brain fog. It's the thing that keeps me going. I think. Well, I mean, I still have to really push myself to go for a run. I'm not. I'm still not a natural at that. Um, but I don't. I never want to slump into sort of mental fogginess again. Yeah, definitely. The, the brain uses a lot of energy, and the problem in a in a in a model where you eating sugar is uh, when you have enough sugar in the diet that your insulin raises. Not only do you shut off the source of fatty acids by by all of your fat cells who ring up all of the the fats in your bloodstream but also the sink of fatty acids how they're turned into energy is shut off as well so what ends up happening is you 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 have only the sugar that you eat you eat if you eat a donut which is roughly you know let's say for the sake of argument your donut's half sugar and half fat um the fat the fat goes straight to your fat cells It, it can't be used for energy and so you're only looking at the sugar component and then what happens once the sugar once you've run out of the sugar is you, you have to wait a couple of hours for the machinery that's able to use fat to start working again, and that's that's where the brain fog comes in. That's yeah. why about about three p.m. every day, people, you know, they get the three p.m. blahs. You know, they've had lunch at one, and two yeah. hours later they're just starting to slow down, so they need a Snickers bar and a, and a cup of tea with yeah. you know, four four teaspoons of sugar in it. <laughs> that's yeah. why. Are you seen them all? And yeah. then they're not sleeping at night properly either. You know, it, it just it just goes on and on and on. And of course, we also know, and this is completely not nutrition related in some ways, but we know with things like phone screens and the amount of screen activity we have and late nights, suddenly we get into a position as well whereby people are, are more tired. And of course, when you're more tired, well, I certainly I, I want to I'm attracted to eating certain foods suddenly, aren't I? Um, so don't worry, Tom, we didn't see anything. So <laughs> this is the this is the middle teenager who probably has to go to college at some point. Sorry. Yeah. I've got, I've got, hey. I've got, I've got three of them back. Yeah, sorry, sorry, Raph. You're 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 live on three continents, but <laughs> Cambridge is not that far from London, wherever you are. <laughs> you might, you might have to pencil him out on the video. <laughs> So I'm just going to ask you, if I may, Tom, about um, an- another area. So to do with politics as well, something that you, you said in your book quite often is when people would ask you, what are you doing to make this change in your life? You would tell them, I'm cutting back on my carbohydrates. I'm increasing my fat intake. But then you'd quite often say the disclaimer of it might not be right for everyone, but it's right for me and check with your doctor and everything. Now, yeah. can I just ask you about that? Because I, I can see two angles to that potentially. And there's probably many more. Um, is that? Do you think that's because of your position in in Parliament and your position in politics that you felt like you had to be very careful what you said because it might go against, you know, the, the political guidelines and not, well, not political government guidelines and also your party position? But or was it more like the individual um, responsibility you had just to say, well, I, I don't know all the answers, so I'm just going to be responsible and say, be careful. I mean, do you, for instance, feel that way so much now, or do you it was feel like you want to tell people? Yeah, it was the latter. I didn't want to preach. Um, I, I, you know, because I guess I'd got a sort of media lens where I saw, you, you know, guy who was morbidly obese suddenly loses weight. People would say, "Oh, it's privilege. He could afford to join a gym. He could do this. He can do that." I didn't. I didn't. And I didn't want to be in a position where I was telling people how to run their lives. I, I thought it's much better to just tell my own story and if and then give advice if they wanted it in in, in a non judgmental, non directional way. And, and I still believe that, to be honest. Um, and you know, I, I I felt a little bit uncomfortable. When I, I, I mean, obviously, I mean, Richard will know this from the podcast, but uh, it was a shock to me. I, I, I started getting a trickle of emails and letters, and, and it, it then became like dozens and dozens a day of emails and letters, and people stopping me in the street, and you, you, you know, and they, <laughs> sooner 
I soon became known as the guy who lost all the weight rather than the guy who happened to be the deputy leader of the Labour Party. And it, it, um, it really, you know, I mean, I wasn't prepared for that. I really wasn't prepared for that. Uh, but I, I, and I'm kind of grateful about it. And, people, and I still get lots of, lots of um, you, you know, unsolicited emails and letters and, and, and feel very responsible for people who are starting the journey or are trying to understand more. Um, so I try and answer them all, but I, I don't want to preach. I, I mean, I'm just writing something that the thing about the book is, you know, it's kind of half eating memoir, half sort of, you know, signposting book. Um, and people said to me, you know, why don't you codify a little bit more about exactly what you did? What was your morning routine? Did you, did you make your bulletproof coffee before you weighed yourself, you know? How did you set your steps target? What devices did you use? Did sort of practical, you know, things that may help people who are on the journey just to, you know, have it stack and do all the things you have to do. Um, so I've started writing a bit of that. Um, but again, I don't want to be, I don't want to say you must do this. This is a blueprint. This it's, it's what worked for me and there's some good ideas in there that may work for you. Is I've always had that approach. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I just don't think you can... I just don't think it works if you ram it down people's throat. You know, they, they, you know, there is a balance. They have to stop. They have to want to start the journey, and when they're on the journey, you can help them go in the right direction. You know, there is that that interplay between personal choice and and, and you know guidance and help is really important. I think. Yeah, for sure, for sure. And that's actually one thing I found interesting. So I'm going to paint a scene for you now. Um, I was buying pants for my three-year-old daughter at the time, listening to Nick Robinson's podcast, as I always do. And um, and then suddenly you came on and he was talking about uh, buttery drinks. And I was like, so, sorry. And I and suddenly, I just <laughs> I remember this so clearly. I put down all my shopping. I called my wife and I said, I think that Tom Watson's doing keto. I can't believe this, you know, <laughs> because I can I, I kind of think, you know, and, and in all seriousness, you know, like Richard and, and Carl, Asima Hotra, there are, there are people that we know in, in this world who are really big. But in all honesty, when you find somebody who is so well known in British, you know, life, uh, who's doing that, suddenly it's a major step where you realize, hang on a minute, this is this is massive. Anyway, and she said to me, um, why, what does he do? And I said, I don't know. I've not listened to it yet. I've just literally heard the beginning and and I just was so excited by that. And it was the fact you came out with your results as well was was probably important. You couldn't say I'm trying keto at the beginning and tell everyone that because they'd, they'd just shoot you down, wouldn't they? But the fact that you have some results behind you means you can have that conversation. But that was so powerful. It's kind of you to say that, Dad, because what, what actually happened there was that was a plastic cup with like Nescafe powder coffee in, and they got one of those little, you know, one of those little butter things you get in sort of self catering restaurant and just dropped it in the top of this coffee, right? It was the most disgusting coffee you've ever had. <laughs> so I thought, I said, that's, not, that's not really what I do, Nick. And this is why. <laughs> but then about two months later, I went back to the, the, TV, the TV radio studio in Westminster that he filmed it from. And there's a canteen, there's a cafeteria down below. And would you believe it? They were selling full on the real McCoy bulletproof coffees in there. Nice. And That's I, said, amazing. I, said, I said, you know, can I have, can I, go, I can't believe it. You got MCT oil. They said, oh, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. I said, and they'd actually got, you know, if you get the branded ones, there's, there's two mm -hmm. different types. Yeah. So I bought the most expensive bulletproof coffee in London there. And I, said, <laughs> so I love this. They said, yeah, do you know what? It's really funny. Uh, you know, we've had loads of journalists come and asking for it. That's why we're laying it on. Apparently, there's some politician who's doing loads of interviews. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 sorry, but, no, you mean I should have had a discount? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, never, I, I never let on. I never let on. But, uh, <laughs> still, I, I think they still do it at the, at the uh, place that the BBC do the interviews. Amazing. I absolutely love that. So, okay, then. So I want to find out now, for May, then, where you are now in your life. Um, because you said, you know, for instance, you're writing this book and you're writing now about this sort of advice you give to people and whatnot. So would you mind sharing kind of, because I imagine in a way, I think a lot of people say this when they come on the podcast, transformation stories are inspirational and they're great, but actually maintenance and finding a rhythm for the rest of your life, that's the most important thing, isn't it? So. Yeah. How do you maintain things now? What's, what works for you, Tom? Okay, so that's a good question. And the one thing I realised, I, I mean, two years ago, I thought I was the Buddha, that I'd reached Nirvana, that I'd, I'd gone through this pain barrier, I'd found a new life, a new equilibrium, and everything was joyful, and I was going to be able to 
meditate for the next 40 years and everything will be great. What I realise is you just reached the peak of one mountain and then there's another mountain to climb. You've only hit the plateau. Uh, and I spent a lot of time in maintenance uh, and I think about it a lot. And, and, and actually, because, you know, lockdown and a change of circumstance really did smash up some really hard fought for routines and habits that I'd created and habits are so important in this. Um, and so it took me a little bit of time to work that out. Um, and I've got this kind of little reset program I do now, right? So if I, you know, I, I, I keep, when I first started, I would weigh myself every day. I'd measure my blood sugar levels, my blood ketone levels, blood pressure. I had stepped counts. I had, I measured my sleep with a, various devices I, the measure because i was a video gamer the measurements were really important to me when i got control of my diet and just led a more active life you can you can let that you don't have to do that with such regularity and what i find is if i you know if i end up getting a little bit chaotic things are slipping work takes me to places and i don't get the right food i just reset you know i go back to my steps target i go back to the scales every day I, you know, I have a little routine where, you know, I'll have a bulletproof coffee in the morning, but I won't eat till lunchtime. Um, you know, I try and get at least three runs in a week. You know, sometimes that's more honoured in the breach, but, you know, depending on the weather, um, I've got the bike out in the front. I'll get, you know, this, so that you, you just go back to what you know uh, and keep it simple, but go back to the routines. And, um it, it's working for me you know i i i i don't do anything to excess anymore um you, you know i, I mean you, you, a bad diet for me is eating too much cheese now too much dairy or maybe a little bit extra fat i i, I mean i i i've literally not drunk beer for three and a half years not because i don't mm-hmm. love alcohol because of the sugar um I tell a lie, I've had two pints of cider on a school reunion and I felt terrible for days afterwards. But I mean, you know, but I, you know, I don't, um, I, I, I don't eat milk chocolate. I don't, you know, all those things that were normal before, even when I think I'm losing a bit of control now, I don't, I never go anywhere near that. Um, so it just fits, but you just, you do need to reset because you always have setbacks and, there's no there's no exit point in a lifestyle change it's the journey isn't it it's the journey it's always about the journey and um, the things i the things i want to spend more time doing that i'm not naturally good at i would really like to do i'd like to be better at mindfulness i'd like to be living in the moment more uh, because that's really important i think for you know cortisol control and all sorts of other things um I, i I, that that's the next little area for me to explore i think you know proper structure i won't some people call it meditation others would just call it you know being in the moment it more of the time um inside and outside uh but yeah i mean look life is good you know once you've once you've cracked it once you've broken the, once you've actually got over it there are always setbacks and bad days and good days uh but it's it's never you know it, it it's you know what, what, like the Matrix. Once you've taken the pill, you know <laughs> even if you eat a donut and you love it and you remember the taste and you get the dopamine anticipation high at the back of your head and then you get the dopamine high when the sugar hits your tongue and you get it at the front of your head. Even then, the voice is saying, "You'll pay for this in two hours' time. You'll pay for this tomorrow." So, all right, let's just have a reset tomorrow. You, it's never it, you know. There's no you, you just don't do things without being conscious about it anymore. And that, that for me, is a really important thing. Amazing, amazing. That's a slightly waffly answer there, Dan. But no, I, no, really powerful answer. It's, 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 it's human. It's human. It's some good techniques there. Really? I was gonna say, it is good. And I think, you know what? Transformation stories are superheroes sometimes. I did this and look at me in six months time. Look at me in a year. But actually the human story is I feel like rubbish. I'm really craving that thing or I want to do whatever it is. And how do I manage that? Not not suppress it, but how do I manage that to make it best for me? And that's a real human connection I think we can have with you there because we do, you know, no one's perfect. No one's got all the answers. There's no end point until you're dead. So I think that's exactly right. It's about the today. What? You, how do you manage this this lifestyle now? Yeah. 
and not you know, try not to punish. I mean, I, 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 I kind of, I live in fear of failure. Of you know, going back to being twenty-two stones in weight. Um, you know, humiliation of sort of talking about all this stuff and then failing, and it to- it tortures me. I know I'm not going to do that though, because I know that will. I know that you know, the, if the if the weight goes up a bit, I. You know, I get anxious about it. That in itself is a new pressure. I never used yeah. to care about weight. You know, I never, I was never conscious of it. It never, it didn't become a thing. But now that I, now that I do care about it, there's a new anxiety in my life, and I've not had for thirty years. So there's different pressures. But if you can, if you're aware of what you, do, you know, if you know what the right thing to do is, you and and what the response should be, you can, you can always get it back on track. But it, it's. Um, you know, you never escape it, do you? There's, there's pressure wherever you are. Definitely. What about you, Richard? How, how do you maintain this as a lifestyle? So, um, I, I don't have weight as a, as a, as a goal, as an endpoint, because <clears throat> my weight can go up or down. Um, I, I can go up a dramatic amount just by getting on my bike. You know, uh, the amount of uh, um, uh, weight I can, I can weigh can change by you know two or three kilograms either side. Um, from one day to another, based on what type kind of exercise I'm doing, and the like. Uh, m- but most the difference between me when I was uh, high carb uh, on a high carb diet and me on a low carb diet is about f- fifty kilograms. So you know, I'm 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 in a plateau, fifty kilograms below where I was. So pla- plateaus actually should. A lot of people find plateaus to be stressful, and they 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 they're frustrated that they can't break through, but. But plateaus can be enjoyed. I mean, a, a, a plateau is significantly further away from your starting point. Um, is an opportunity to 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 enjoy how far you've come and enjoy uh, enjoy how uh, you, the, the the health that you had. For me, it was always about toes. I was when I first started this, I was about to lose a toe. I had a, an ingrown toenail that had, that had gone septic, and and the doctor said to me, "If you can't get your blood glucose down," and he looked me in the eyes and he said, "I don't think you can." Um, then uh, that may you may lose that toe, and that's what shocked me, um, led me to, to Tim Noakes stuff, and, and and eventually to going ketogenic. Uh, but I look back at that now. That was uh, seven uh, seven and a half years, roughly ago, and uh, I I know for a fact that um, fat cells in our body live roughly ten years. There was a really excellent Swedish study that used the um, <clears throat> the radioactive material in the atmosphere from nuclear testing and the fact that it went up and then it went down again. That was a signal that they could use to look at. They basically do these fat biopsies and work out what how how old your 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 fat is and how how your fat cells turn over from a, an old one dying to a new one coming up over time. And they worked out it's roughly ten years. So in two and a half years, that's my next goal. Uh, to be still non-diabetic in two and a half years. In two and a half years, not a single fat cell in my body will ever remember having been in a, in a diabetic body, and that's kind of a goal for wow. me. Wow, you know, so that, so that uh, yeah. And, and what? And, and physiologically, you think your sort of uh, response to different inputs will is changing because of that? That's that's yeah. really fascinating. Tell me a little bit more yeah. about that. Rob. So over to, over to your fat cells uh, uh, were used to a, a endocrine a hormonal milieu that was based around storing as much energy as they can until they became yeah. hyperplasic. So so um, so essentially, I, I still have fat cells that, that remember that, and so um, uh, my it, it, it may just be a, a personal goal really to get to ten years and to still have a five point two percent. Uh, uh, HbA1c Th- that that's essentially my goal is to to, to yeah. flatline the amount of glucose in my body to 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 be only made by my liver. So yeah. um, I eat as little glucose as I possibly can during the day. Let my liver keep the, that level going, and my goal is to do that for ten years so that I have only fat cells that have that have been used to that kind of milieu. And so wow, yeah. yeah. So essentially, that that's that's my next goal. But you know that I I have no doubt that I'll get there. I mean, eating a low carb diet is not difficult to keep your HbA one C in in check, is it? Oh, oh that's right. Uh, yeah. That's so clever, though. I mean, it's because that gives you actually, you, you know, because you get when you first start, you need almost I needed almost hour by hour targets, let alone day by day yeah. targets. Yes, but yeah. actually, giving yourself a sort of quite far out there target stretch stretch goal yeah that's clever isn't it that's a clever way 
psychologically that's clever, I think, as well. Just out of interest then, Richard, just on that point, (laughs) when cells become, and I appreciate you just on the spot here, but when cells become insulin resistant, I believe it's the case that the receptor changes shape, which is why the cell swells and it can't actually listen to the insulin anymore. There's actually a, a physical change there. When it goes back to being slightly smaller again, because it's storing less fat, how long does it take for the cell to repair itself properly? Or is it back to where it was? Or is it just like you said, all cells have to be replenished and changed? Yeah, so I don't know the answer to that, and I think we as a, as a species don't know the answer to that yet um, uh, because we're not focusing on those kinds of questions, which which would be yeah. a good, that, that question would be a good one to answer. I do know about insulin resistance. There are, and, and this is the case with, with biology, and a lot of people, especially nutritionists, get, get a lot of biology. They, they reduce everything. Human beings do this. We see a complex situation. We try and reduce it as much as possible to a simple formula and then we then that's that's the model in our brain that we're going to use to refer to that complex thing and um i do know that insulin resistance happens multiple places so one one place that insulin resistance happens is if insulin goes up uh there uh as you know your fat cells will hoover up fat but also all of your mitochondria all of your cells that utilize energy that could possibly burn fatty acids for energy the transport that transports um that fatty acid into the mitochondria to be turned into ATP instead in, in, instead of glucose um, mm-hmm. to, to, to power the body, that transport is blocked. It's inhibited by insulin going up. So insulin signaling does that, and what it does is it stops fat getting into the mitochondria. That's the sink of fatty acids. And so what happens is then fat builds up, and what in, in cells, say cells in your pancreas or in your liver or in your muscle cells, they, they, they develop... Uh, that they basically there's there's no way for the fat to go. It can't be can't be utilised to turn to energy. So it forms lipid gob, uh, lipid uh, droplets inside inter, intracellular. In, in the case of muscle cells, intramyocellular lipid droplets form these micelles where essentially the fat is is sitting there waiting to, to, for its opportunity to be used. But as long as insulin is up, it can't be used. Well, that that lipid droplet that utilises a protein called SNAP23. To, to be able to hold its structure. SNAP23 is necessary for the glucose transporter to work. So what that means is that the insulin signal that turns the fat use off is also telling the glute transporter, come to the cell surface so that you can fuse with the surface, take this glucose and bring it into the cell. So what happens is if, if as your lipid droplets are building up, these glucose transporters can't get to the to the to fuse to the to the cell because the that the lipid droplet is yeah. using this protein. And so just the process of having a high insulin means you need more insulin to get glucose in, but the mechanism is you're not able to burn fat. So this is really, this is something that we don't really think about a lot. We, we think a lot about fat cells, about fat being involved with fat cells, but it's actually in the ability to utilise fatty acids for energy that that is the real problem, I believe, with diabetes. So. Wow. Sorry, comp- long, complicated story. No. I wave my hands. Keep around. going. This is great. You have your personal keto yeah. dude experience. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so, 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 I mean, this this is the problem. We t- we tend to think about the source of fatty acids. We tend to think about how's the fat getting into our blood. Well, it's obviously we're releasing it from our fat cells and we're eating it. That's obviously where the source of it's coming from the blood into the blood. We don't think about where how it's getting out of the blood. It's a very useful compound. I mean, we can utilize it for energy. We also utilize it to make our cell membranes. Fats are a very useful molecule. We're not going to waste it by 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 filtering it out of the blood. So the only way we get rid of it is by is by pulling it into the cell and then getting into the mitochondria to utilize for energy. And if we if we stop that, we inhibit that. Uh, essentially, what happens is insulin signaling in the cell. Uh, raises AMPK, which is a, 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 a essentially a, it's a it's a, a um, it's a signal that um, that we should switch from from one metabolism from fat burning to, to to glucose burning. That that actually shuts down the transport of fatty acids into the mitochondria, and it starts instead taking every acetyl CoA, every every sort of um, precursor to making energy turns that into making new fat and shuffling it out of the out of the out of the cell and it get, then gets sent off in uh, to the to the fat cells to be stored so essentially what's happening is insulin is this master regulator that we're saying now fat now 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 glucose now fat now glucose when it's pointing at glucose 
what it's going to do is get all of the glucose into the cell and any that the cell doesn't need to utilize for energy right away, it, it then turns into fats to be exported off and into storage. When it's on fat, now what happens is that the, the cell is utilizing fatty acids for energy because there's no glucose around and it's producing ketones um, essentially for, for tissue that, that's unable to, to get a large supply of fatty acids in like the brain, for example. So, you know, it's, it's, it, insulin is, is really the master regulator for all of this, but it's how it's whether we're utilising fat um, that, uh, or not for energy that drives all of this. And, you know, Tom was saying that he's calm all day. I think this is a, this is a function of Tom being able to efficiently provide energy he 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 never needs to get upset about where his next meal comes from because um, he's he's still got enough body fat on him that he can he can happily go for you know twelve twenty four maybe even thirty six hours without worrying too much about getting it getting a feed yeah. um, where it, where where you know his competitors across the aisle are probably hungry after two hours after a meal and they they they're twitching to get off to the pub to have a beer. <laughs> it's so true, isn't it? Because you don't. It's it's all semi-conscious or subconscious. When you if you're looking for your next sugar fix, mm-hmm. you know I find myself thinking about food a lot more. You know, just journeying to places where there was food, um, and uh, other than having to live next door to a fridge. Right. Oh, well, his line just went we, there. I think we might have lost. Lost Tom a on great the great moment as well, though, wasn't it? <laughs> Can you hear us, Tom? I think he's. Uh, hang on a minute. It might just be his camera. Um, just while he was uh, just uh, while he's coming back on again, I just I just suddenly realised when you said that, uh, and I think Tom was sort of saying the same thing there. But the baseline anxiety that people are under, you, you can't actually, I suppose, underestimate the power of that. That baseline anxiety, day in day out of feeling like they've just got to eat, got just got to eat, got to, got to eat. Subconsciously, it's not even not something they even realise they're doing. That has got to take its toll after a while, hasn't it? Like chronic anxiety yeah. like that? Well, your brain is using a lot of the energy in your body. It's a very high, it's a it's a, 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 an organ that uses a lot of energy yeah. um, preferentially. And so um, uh, what happens is as, as your energy levels drop, uh, and and we kind of think of uh, brain energy as the amount of glucose in the blood, but it's not really that. Of course, it's uh, um, it's uh, uh, the brain will happily run on at tw- up to twenty five percent ketones. But um, as the as the the uh, level of glucose drops, it's it's emergency. I mean, the liver gets kicked into emergency mode to start making more glucose because you know it's dropping in the blood. So. Um, yeah, it's uh, it's not surprising that people who are unable to utilise fatty acids at all for energy, all of a sudden have no ketones, have no energy coming into their cells. They're they they're 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 essentially given a metabolic signal to be lethargic. Wow. So in that case, do you mind me just asking you a few questions? Because this is really, really fascinating. And I didn't no. know how this podcast was going to go because, you know, <laughs> it's Tom, it's you, it's me. I mean, it's quite a few different angles we can go down. Um, OK, why does the body burn sugar first? Uh, that is an excellent question because probably because it can store fat. Uh, okay. The, the reason why fat can store very easily is, is it, it's, it's kind of like, um, uh, uh, well, fat stacks very easily. So it's like storing a, a you know, a, a stack of pancakes versus a stack of bread loaves. You can imagine a stack of 24 pancakes and walking around with it on a plate without too much trouble, but imagine that a plate with 24 bread bread rolls, you know, that would yeah, be a very different yeah. store. So so uh, water soluble molecules have to be stored with water. They won't they won't they won't stack with each other. Whereas, you know, uh, fat fatty acids will, will stack quite nicely. So you can get twice the energy per gram if you're using fat than you can if you're using glucose. And that's why most animals use fat as a storage mechanism of a buffer against uh, you know, against having a bad day, having a bad hunt. You, you you have fat as your buffer that makes sure that you've got energy, um, it, uh, bet- you know, uh, between meals. And so, um, so so we essentially burn glucose first because we know we're not going to be able to store much of that. that that's right. essentially the, the the reason why. But it's um, it, it's also uh, it's also because we can that the process of making glucose is, ex- is more expensive than the process of making fat. And so mm-hmm. um, that's also another another reason why. 
Okay. Is it also that kind of sugar, I guess, evolutionary speaking, just was not av- available? So, you know, making fat is, is just a better system chemically in terms of the physics, the energy you get from that, but also in terms of access, you know, this time of year for us now in, in, in the Northern Hemisphere, people are eating apples, I suppose, to fatten up for winter, aren't they? But give it another month or two, there would be nothing available like that at all. I mean, you know, it's all gone. And of course, the only thing that's around then would be something like a ruminant animal to, to hunt, I, I suppose. Um, right. Which I think that, that evolutionary thing, you know, I, I find it fascinating how evolution doesn't have a will or a meaning behind it. It just literally was the best solution to a problem. That's you survived because some other guy didn't because he yeah. was eating something that wasn't there anymore and you were able to, to get by. And I find it interesting how now we sort of say you should have whole grains and, you know, things that you'd never have got in your country at that yeah. time of year, which I just find incredible. Yeah, it's, uh, I mean, we are all evolutionary byproducts of trillions of uh, experiments that worked. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah. and every, other, every other life on the planet is also the same of different experiments that also worked. So, you know, that's, uh, uh, the, the problem is, I guess, that, that uh, agriculture is only, what, 12,000 12, years old, roughly. Yeah, um, nice age, yeah. Um, you know, um, uh, 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 certainly um, grain production, I think, uh, might have been before animal husbandry, but um, but then, you know, the milk, um, um, uh, you know, uh, dairy, dairy came along very shortly after that. Yes, eight so, so all of the, yeah. all of these things happened in I mean this is your this is your specialty really isn't it? it? So, Thank you. Uh, yeah, you know, yeah. I, I like to think so. Actually I've got uh, Giles Yo coming on next week. He's a geneticist nice. here locally. Yeah. And actually it's okay. the first time ever I'm going to get to do the podcast in person in their house because, well, it didn't have to be his house, but he, he very kindly invited me over to his house. Um, he probably has a not. studio in his house. <laughs> yeah, yeah, he probably does, doesn't he? I'd be very envious um, because actually I started this, pan, this uh, the, like the beginning of the pandemic. It's February 2020 I started recording um, mm. with very much the intention of doing face-to-face in the summer. And then, of course, March 2020, everything locked down. It was kind of game over in terms of podcast recording. Um, and so I just decided, oh, okay, we'll just do it via, you know, zoom or whatever else so actually the thought of doing it face to face is a bit weird like oh okay (laughs) the person's gonna be in front of me what do i say i better not dribble (laughs) (laughs) there's something embarrassing you know or stupid so uh yeah so i'm sure it'll be fine but i want to ask him about that because you know i I find that a lot of experts have got their own particular area they look at and of course he talks a lot about the genes and there's something in your genes that predisposes you to eat more, to, you know, to, to be somebody who's obese or whatever. He very much looks at the calorie in calorie out argument, which I would obviously question him on that. But I think that's, it's an interesting thing to realize those genes have actually helped you survive and they have helped themselves survive. I suppose the selfish gene Mm -hmm. idea there, and that has happened through for millions and millions of years. And, and we can't, we program millions of years of evolution. It just is what it is. You have to accept what you are and work with what you've got. Welcome back, Tom. You're all right. Sorry, Dan. We've been talking for so long. My computer ran out. Oh, oh yeah, sorry about that. <laughs> I'm so sorry. Are you okay to go on for a bit longer? Because I appreciate that it's like a lot yeah, of time. And I've got I've got five or ten minutes. If that's okay. Yeah. Sorry. Of course. About that. Of course. Yeah. Of course. We're just uh, just to fill you in quickly there. Richard was uh, telling me a lot about a lot of things, um, and then we went into a bit of human <laughs> evolution, which is my area. I, that's my degree is in evolution, and I, and I personally think that when you know how you work, it's very simple, isn't it? It's just finding the manual, you know, like those beautiful car manuals you used to get with the drawings of how it all works inside. When you understand how you work and you realize the evolution behind that, then suddenly you are happier and healthier. And I just was just going through that then. Um, but yeah, <laughs> so that's where you joined us, Tom. I don't Very think you missed too much. Yeah. I, I, I miss a lot. <laughs> well, don't worry. It's a podcast. You can listen to it later. <laughs> In fact, you can respond on Twitter like, no, I, I disagree. I would have said this. Like, Richard's bang out of order and Dan doesn't know what he's talking about. <laughs> yeah, that's okay. So I say, gonna... That's the world I've left behind. But anyway, yeah, there you oh, go. okay, okay, okay. I'm trying to trying to motivate you to get back into it again, but never mind. Okay, um, I just want to ask you while you're both here. Then, as we've only got a few moments left, really, um, this has been quite an academic podcast. I think it's fair to say because you two are very knowledgeable and you've got a wide, uh, you know, amount of reading behind you. Um, I think it's fair to say that we're all geeks here. I think that's you know a commonality we have between us. So. People who are listening to this now, who are deciding, you know, they want to find out more, they want to educate themselves. Um, 
just going from kind of gr- grassroots up, really, from the podcast level to more academic texts and places, where would you both recommend people go to start learning about some of the science behind the food that we eat? Uh, let's start with you, Tom, and then we'll go to you next, Richard. Well, I would say, I mean, your podcast, Dan, I mean, two keto dudes, that, that's where I started. I mean, go through the back catalogue. Um, this, you, you know, the, the repertoire starts with the basics and then, you know, practical advice as well as a lot of science. Um, I found the website Diet Doctor very helpful. Um, I think there's a sort of pay element to that with videos behind that, uh, you know, I invested in. Um that's probably a good starting point. Um, there is an organisation in the UK called Public Health Collaboration, which uh, promotes, um, y- y- you know, re- science-led practical advice on how you can live a low-carb lifestyle. Um, and, you know, if you start there, that will get you on the journey, I think. Um, and But there are basic things you can do without doing a lot of reading and, you know, it probably starts with giving up sucrose, uh, sugar products, uh, and then you're on your journey to low carb and keto if you start there. Yeah, fantastic. What about yourself, Richard? Where do you recommend people check out? So um, I like to 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 watch lots of uh, YouTube uh, videos from from uh, experts. In fact, that's how I got into this. Uh, so you know, anything from Tim Burks or Steve Finney. I think are excellent sources. Anything from Eric Westman is also an excellent source. Uh, the the set the 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 new and improved Atkins for a new you. I think was the name of the book that was co-authored by Eric Westman, Stephen Finney, and Jeff Volek is an excellent source. So if you're looking for just practical, translatable things that you can start doing immediately, then 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 that's that's an excellent source. Um, uh, too right. Yes, the, this, the, the, the book that Dan's holding up right now, The Art and Science of Low-Carbohydrate Living. Yeah. Um, a few, a few books I recommend there. Uh, yes, and <laughs> Downsizing by Tom Watson, yes. Uh, so I, uh, I would say anything by those researchers, similar to time, I, I, every, every time somebody gave me information, I'd look for the references where they got their information from. This is just a, a, a standard uh, way an academic um, – drills into a topic to, to understand the breadth of the topic. Um, but really keto is, is it doesn't, a ketogenic diet, um, not everybody needs it, but a type 2 diabetic, it's, it, it, it really is one of the mechanisms that will um, that can reverse um, type 2 diabetes. So if, like me, um, you're facing type 2 diabetes, you may have been told by a doctor that, that you need to go on insulin or that that's in your immediate future or any of the complications of diabetes like lower extremity amputation or blindness um, and and kidney disease all of these things if those things are, are, are enough to be able to, uh, to to force you to 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 look into this i would say that the simplest way of of going on a ketogenic diet is just removing all sugar and starch from your diet and uh, pretty much the rest all works itself out most most people are capable of eating uh, uh, not being deficient in, in the amount of protein that they eat and not eating too much. Both of those two things tend to sort themselves out. Um, and then you just let fat, um, fat, you want to run your body on fat. Um, so you, that, that could be fat on your plate or, uh, or fat on your body that, you know, from a Krispy Kreme that, that you ate a decade ago. And you just let society <laughs> be your signal. And you, you probably won't be model, model thin, but you, you'll be non-diabetic and that's better than being model thin. You can outrun any model anyway. So, so that, that, <laughs> I hope you're out to live as well. Yeah. Yes. yeah, live healthier. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I just want to say uh, a huge thank you to both of you today. Thank you for coming on, Tom, initially, but also thank you, Richard, for making this show extra special. Um, I've, I've genuinely really enjoyed my morning today, and I think it's been so educational and, and enjoyable in all sorts of ways. So thank you to you both, and uh, I wish you all the very best of your journeys, wherever that takes you next. Thanks, Dan. And lovely to yeah, meet you. you. A genuine honour. Genuine honour. Thank you. Like, right. Likewise, I'm honoured, Tom, and thank you very much, Dan, for inviting me. That's all right. Okay. Cheers, guys. Take thank care. You. Have a great right. day. Bye. All right. All right.